House Energy and Commerce Committee continues its markup on energy and climate change legislation. This is day four of the markup session. Live coverage on C-SPAN 3. For the last month, I've been engaged in an intensive uh, I've worked with a successful negotiation with the American Flags Commission and the American Party in order to address these important concerns. And these are exactly the same concerns that illuminated the amendment that came from Mr. Jones. And those concerns are keeping electricity rates affordable in the areas where the dominance of electricity is generated by coal combustion. Paving a way for expanding coal production through technology as and also preserving thousands of coal jobs that attend the coal industry. And I am very satisfied with the arrangements that we have made, which are now reflected in the text of the bill that the committee is marking up. Let me just mention some of the agreements we have achieved that are very important to the success of the coal industry. First of all, we have obtained the provision of 90% of the emission allowances to electric utilities without charge. And that was truly a major step forward that helps to cushion any effect on electricity rates uh, accounting uh, because of the process by which emission allowances are allocated. Secondly, we've obtained 2 billion tons of offsets that will enable the emitting entities to obtain their reductions while continuing to use coal. Utilities will be able to continue their existing fuel mix by taking their reductions off-site, by investing in agriculture, by investing in forestry, and through other steps. Two billion tons of offsets available every year for that purpose. The target for emission reductions by the year 2020 has been reduced from the original target that was set uh, in the draft that Mr. Waxman circulated down to a, a target of 17 percent. I continue to have some concerns about that target. I believe a lower number actually is appropriate and under the agreement that we've achieved, I, I intend to work at future stages of this process in order uh, to obtain improvement and I believe that is potentially possible. We also have bonus allowances for carbon capture and sequestration deployment by utilities at the time that these technologies become available. And those bonus allowances are valued at somewhere between 75 and $100 billion, depending upon what the then current value of emission allowances happens to be. We have embedded within the legislation our separate bill that assures the flow of $1 billion annually in research, development, and demonstration funding to the development of carbon capture and sequestration technologies. And the Electric Power Research Institute tells us that with that level of assured funding, we can count on available, affordable, and reliable carbon capture and sequestration technologies being made available by the year 2020. I can say that uh, across uh, the entire range of interested parties, from utilities to major companies within the coal industry, to the United Mine Workers, there is uniform agreement that these are major step forwards. There is uniform agreement that this legislation and the form in which you see it should proceed through this committee. And there's also uniform agreement that we should continue to work for further improvements. And that's a cause to which I am certainly committed. Let me say that at the outset of this process, I had really hoped that we would have a bipartisan measure and beginning more than two years ago when we began the work on developing cap and trade legislation in, in the subcommittee, we extended a hand of partnership to our Republican colleagues. Unfortunately, that offer has been declined. Uh, that offer remains open, and I am hoping that at future steps in this process, that offer will in fact be accepted and that we will have bipartisan cooperation and help as we proceed to move this measure through the House and through subsequent steps in the legislative process. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time's expired. The vote will now occur on the Shimkiss Amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. no.
Do you want to take it? Do you guys want to record a vote on this? Do you want to record a vote yeah. on this? Yeah. 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 Recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Malison. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of, Connect of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. S Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield passes. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattig. Mr. Shattig, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Mr. Rodanovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. 
votes aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingrey. Mr. Gingrey votes aye. Mr. Scullis. Mr. Scullis votes aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. Angle, is he here? No. Mr. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Mr. Malinson. No. Mr. Malinson votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky votes no. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Dr. Burgess recorded. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Whitfield is off pass and on aye. Are there any other members wishing to vote? Clerk will report the tally. On that, on that vote, Madam Chair, the ayes the eyes were 22 and the nays were 34. 22 to 34, the amendment is not agreed to. Madam Chair. Gentleman from North Carolina. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the title. Amendment offered by Mr. Butterfield from North Carolina and Mr. Hill from Indiana. What? Page 341. Line four. Not objection. The amendment uh, move the amendment can be considered as read. Technical. Gentlemen's recognized in support of his amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'll be brief. I realize that it's late in the afternoon, but thank you for recognizing me. Uh, Madam Chair, this amendment provides two clarifications to the transportation right. section of the bill. I'd like to speak on the second issue uh, in this amendment. The provision grants the EPA administrator the authority to promulgate emission standards for non-road vehicles and engines. While the well-meaning base text seeks to allow the administrator to set standards for the largest emitters, references as locomotives and marine vessels by the end of 2012, the current language fails to differentiate between large and small emitters within those categories, for example, a small engine in a fishing boat. Uh, this amendment makes clear that the intent is to have the administrator apply earlier standards to categories based on uh, two criteria. Uh, first, these standards should apply to the largest emitters, and then secondly, uh, that the large emitters have the greatest One. potential for significant and cost-effective emission reductions. In other words, Madam Chair, this amendment directs the administrator to apply standards to categories where the Chairman most significant... Yield. Yes, I will yield. Not that it counts, but we're willing to accept it. Well, I thank you, uh, Ranking Member. I'm going to stop with that and, and yield the balance of my time to uh, the gentleman from Indiana. I thank the uh, gentleman from North Carolina for yielding, and I would like to um, thank the chairman for working with me and Mr. Butterfield on this uh, very important amendment. Uh, the first half of this amendment involves sectors in the vehicle and engine industry not covered by the administration's fuel economy ruling this week. Heavy duty on highway mobile sources, locomotives, and marine vessels and non-road vehicles and engines, 18 diesel engines for 18 wheelers is, is what it uh, means in layman's term. I've been working with uh, your staff, Mr. Butterfield's staff, and stakeholders to ensure that multiple federal agencies do not have conflicting regulatory authority. The previous draft of the mobile source provision charged both the Trans Department of Transportation and the Environmental Protection Agency with regulatory authority. The agreement we've struck would allow the Environmental Protection Agency the ability to oversee the regulation of these mobile sources. 
Uh, I thank the Chairman and Mr. Butterfield for working together in a bipartisan fashion to craft an amendment that solves two issues in an efficient manner. And if Mr. Shattuck uh, is around, I would yield to him. But Gentleman from North Carolina controls the time. You can yield back to him and he can yield to me. Reclaiming my time, I, I yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Would you? He's not here. He's uh, not in the room, but he, he says good things about you we, telepathically. We've accepted it. <laughs> well, thank you. I reclaim. Uh, 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 if yeah, the gentleman would yeah. yield to the chair. The, Chairman, I yield to the chair. Chairman Waxman yeah. would like to commend you and Mr. Hill for your thoughtful work on the amendment. The language that's been developed will provide the engine manufacturers with the lead time and stability they need to, to while ensuring that uh, we get environmental protection. So uh, uh, Chairman Waxman would urge all members to support this amendment. I thank the chair. I yield back the balance of my Chairman time. Chairman yields back. The vote now. Occurs. Madam Chairman. No, no, vote, vote. Oh, Je yes. No, do the vote Before. first. Uh, the, the vote. Um, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The amendment is agreed to. Madam Chairman. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? I have an uh, amendment. I have Someone better reserve. actually, uh, is Mr. Boucher in the room? He wanted me to wait till Mr. Boucher. Is Mr. Boucher in the back? I thought he was sitting believe, on the, so, on, the on side of you. Otherwise, let's go to Mr. Whitfield. I the Madam Chair, I reserve a point of order. An amendment at the desk. There is no amendment to reserve a point of order for. I will, okay. let, I will defer to Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Boucher is not present. Does, does the gentleman from Kentucky have an amendment? At yes, uh, Whitfield Amendment 02. Clerk will record the title. Name starts with a B. Can I sit over there? Amendment offered by Mr. Whitfield of Kentucky. One strike, strike from page 448, line two. The amendment page will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized in support of his amendment. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Um, this amendment is designed to do two things. Number one, it's designed to minimize the volatility in the trading market for allowances, particularly the secondary market. Number two, it's designed to provide additional funding for carbon capture and sequestration research. I will be the first to admit that in the bill, there is a billion dollars a year for carbon capture and sequestration research for a period of years. But most experts in the field recognize that since this technology has not been perfected, that there is no commercial application except a, a very small one in Canada and also one in Norway, and that it would dramatically change the way we do business and produce electricity in America, that we need exceptionally large sums of money in order to continue to produce electricity at a reasonable rate. Now, the way that this deals with the volatility, and let me just say that, for example, in the bill, there are some international offsets. EPA itself said that if these offsets do not materialize, they could have underestimated the price of allowances by some 96 percent. In addition, a few years ago, the National Commission on Energy Policy released a report entitled Ending the Energy Stalemate. Panel members of that commission included representatives of the, natu the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Consumers Union, professors from Harvard and MIT, and private industry representatives. Their recommendation was that we need a safety valve with a reasonably low trigger to provide stability in the secondary markets. Another reason we need th this legislation, this amendment, is that experience in the European Union showed quite clearly that there was extreme volatility in these secondary markets. Now, how do we address the problem in this amendment? Well, we eliminate the strategic reserve that's set up in this bill. The strategic reserve allowances will be available to people under and entities under certain circumstances. But the minimum price under the strategic reserve is $28 per metric ton. The allowances under the bill 
or $10 per metric ton. And then I might also add that under the strategic reserve, 60 percent above the rolling 36-month average of an allowance will be the price for the strategic reserve. So my point is the strategic reserve does not do a very good job or a predictable job on what the price of these allowances will be. And with a bill with affecting so many segments of our society, dramatically changing the way we do business in America, we really do not understand how this volatility issue will work. And so my amendment simply sets a price beginning in the year 2013 of $15 per metric ton with a 5 percent plus inflation increase every year thereafter, just the same as the minimum price set out in the bill. But the difference is that those people that would buy these allowances pay this money uh, into this account, that money would be directed for carbon capture and sequestration research. And that money will be desperately needed if we're going to protect the coal industry. Now, Mr. Boucher went into great detail about what's in here for the coal industry. And there are some things in here for the coal industry. But I can tell you that the coal industry and a lot of other industries do not support this bill. The other side of the aisle was also very good at giving us an opportunity to provide input. But at some times, you reach a point where you simply cannot agree, and so you have to walk away. And that's precisely what we did. I think this amendment is vitally important to provide the stability in the secondary markets and to provide additional funding for carbon capture and sequestration research. And I would ask uh, all of you to support this amendment. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair will yield herself five minutes. There are many good ways to make sure that a limit on carbon will be affordable for business and, con and consumers, but a technology accelerator payment option, which is just another way to say a price cap, is not that way. The bill already contains many strong cost containment tools, and here are a few of the most important ones. Trading itself is a powerful way of reducing costs, providing firms flexibility to make the reductions whenever they are the least expensive. The bill already provides for a strategic allowance reserve that can be tapped in case of price spikes. And like oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, allowances from the reserve can be sold to stabilize prices. The bill allows emitters to use a generous quantity of high-quality, low-cost offsets to comply with their obligations. And many studies have found that offsets will have a big impact in keeping allowance prices moderate. In addition, emitters can borrow allowances from future years and bank current allowances for use in the future. But this works very differently from a price cap. Instead of controlling costs while also preserving the cap on carbon pollution, a price cap simply abandons the environmental goal. This amendment would eliminate the national limit on global warming pollution. A, pr a price cap would create uncertainty, which would discourage companies from investing in the new technologies that we need. For example, we need utilities to invest in carbon capture and sequestration, a technology that will create new jobs and also reduce power plant emissions. By discouraging innovation, a price cap could end up raising costs in the long run. And finally, a price cap would make it difficult for the U.S. to enter into an international climate treaty. The bill also contains a range of features tailored to manage costs. This amendment is unnecessary and it will effectively gut the pollution limits in the bill. If anyone else wishes to be recognized, the chair will yield. Madam Speaker, I'd like to. Uh, uh, the gentleman from California. Thank you. Uh, I certainly appreciate the gentleman from Kentucky's concern about prices. Uh, and no one wants to see our uh, consumers pay more for electricity, but uh, price caps is going to act like a rent control. Uh, that's what President Nixon tried. and. Basically, we saw the long lines for gasoline. Uh, it'll basically make the mar it'll basically uh, make the market non-functional. So, I think the um, trading uh, 
allowances is a very efficient way, it's a very efficient economic way to allow innovation into the market. So I'm going to uh, stand in opposition to the amendment and urge my colleagues to do uh, the same. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Madam Chairman, may I have one minute to respond to the gentleman? From Absolutely. Uh, yesterday, the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board met and they discussed the cap and trade legislation that is before this committee. And one of the specific issues that they talked a lot about was the price volatility in the allowances. So there's a lot of genuine concern about it. And uh, I, I appreciate the gentleman from California's uh, observations, uh, but uh, many of us uh, would disagree with that assessment. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Chair yields back. The vote will now occur on the Whitfield Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The chair's opinion, no's have it. I ask for a roll call vote. A uh, roll call vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. <clears throat> Mr. Gordon. No. <clears throat> Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Chukowski. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melison. Mr. Melison, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Ms. Sutton. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. 
Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut votes no. I, I would like to be recorded as voting no. I'm sorry. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Did I call you? Okay. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Ms. Chikowski. Is she here? No, I don't see her. Um, Ms. Chikowski. Ms. Chikowski votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Matheson. Is he here? I'm sorry, I thought I saw him. Anybody else here? Anybody else here? <laughs> Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Miss Ms. Sutton. Miss Sutton votes no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes no. All members responded to the vote. Uh, the clerk will uh, tally the vote and report it. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 20, uh, 20 ayes and 35 noes. 20 ayes, 35 noes. The, um, the amendment is not agreed to. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. Could I enter into a colloquy just on the schedule? Yes. Um, we keep hearing various um, estimations about when the House is going to conclude its business uh, today. The, the agreement that you and I had last evening was that the committee would would stay in session to finish the markup and we would shoot as a, a target of concluding about an hour after the House has finished its business for the day. Is that still your intention? 
That's still my intention. If we could do it earlier, that would be my preference. So if, if we're finished around the estimate that we've got an estimate between 4.30 and 7. So if we're finished at 4.30, you want to be, we want to be out of here by 5.30. And if we're finished at 7, you want to be out by 8 or sooner. I, I think that's right. I, I, the estimate I last heard was 6. So if we finish at 6, then we want to be out by 7. Yes, but uh, since you control so much of the time we'll spend on amendments, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to think through whether it's essential that we have 23 to 30 votes on every single amendment, because some of them can be offered and you can argue that we defeated them and say how I terrible it was. You don't have to argue that you defeated them. You did defeat them. Well, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Well, a... we can defeat them on a voice vote. We don't need a roll call vote on every one. And well, we won't have 23 to 30 votes on every issue, I promise you. Uh, we've, we've, we've had substantial votes, uh, differences on, on these amendments. You're entitled to roll call votes, and the chair will protect that right. Uh, I'd, I'd only ask you that uh, we not plan the number of amendments and whether there'll be roll call votes to make sure that we're an hour later, if we can finish an hour no, sooner. We just we have approximately 10 more amendments, and so let's go. So we're trying to let's go. We might encourage you to encourage the clerk to read a little. I know she's done yeoman's work. In fact, we ought to give her a hand because she's done such good work this. <clears throat> that almost sounded like a, a backhanded compliment. No, no, no. It was not backhanded. <laughs> she's done. Now what would you want yeah. us to encourage her to do? Uh, Get the speed reader in? Perhaps. <laughs> well, you know, I, Mr. Chairman, I promised you last night I'm not going to force the reading of any long-winded. But I may force the reading of a five-page amendment just to hear that young man read. I think it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it might be entertaining just to see what a speed reader sounds like. I fear that based on your promise last night, we let him go. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but I'm not sure. If about. that's the case. Anyway, we, we just want to, we, we are working very um, diligently on our side to make sure that you're, we meet your timeline request. I thank you very much for that. Uh, the uh, amendment would now go to the Republican side. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pitt. I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, uh, well, the, the clerk will report the amendment. Pitt 009. And uh, without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. Reserve a point of order. A point of order is reserved. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment that I'm offering is uh, co-sponsored by Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. We're, we're offering a quite simple amendment. The amendment okay. defines renewable as any form of energy that a state law deems as renewable or alternative. That's okay. 29 states and the District of Columbia have renewable or alternative electricity standards. Many of the state standards include renewable or alternative forms of energy that are not included in the American Clean Energy Security Act. And I think we've circulated a list of the states with RES. The federal RES in the bill before us is in addition to, not in lieu of, any existing state renewable mandate. Thus, states must comply with their own state standards along with a federally mandated standard, which may be difficult to meet. States understand their own geographic resources. The federal government should defer to individual states to decide what form of energy will best allow them to meet their renewable and alternative standard. Again, I've spoken to the Public Utility Commission in Pennsylvania, and this is a bipartisan uh, group. They have uh, sent a letter to us. Uh, I'll submit that letter uh, for the record. Uh, Mr. Uh, if there's if there's no objection, Mr. without objection, we'll receive the letter and, and put it in the record. They've spoken out in a strongly bipartisan uh, way, requesting uh, this kind of amendment. Um, Pennsylvania is a, a classic case. The state has approved a two-tiered alternative energy portfolio standard, uh, 18 percent. Some of the forms of electricity that the governor and the state legislature have deemed as renewable cannot be found in the American Clean Energy Security Act. If a, a federal RES is passed into law, 
states should be able to receive federal credits for the source of energy they deem to be renewable or alternative. And uh, with that, I'll yield to Mr. Murphy. Uh, he's not here. Uh, I'll uh, reserve. He's not. The gentleman yielded his your I'll time yield. to Mr. Murphy, but he's not here at the moment, is he? Uh, I'll yield back. Oh, you yield back the time? Your time? Chairman, I'll withdraw my point of order. The gentleman withdraws her point of order. Chair recognizes Mr. Markey. I thank the, uh, the gentleman very much. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an essential part of any law which we pass here today. We are trying to construct a national plan for the creation of a new generation of clean energy jobs. Uh, we are trying to create a new generation of technologies that will make it possible for us to back out imported oil from OPEC. We are creating a new plan that will make it possible for us to reduce dramatically the greenhouse gases that are sent up into the atmosphere that are dangerously warming our planet. We are trying to put together a national plan uh, to improve the public health of the citizens uh, in our country. We are writing a federal national law. That is our job. And this provision, the provision that deals with renewable electricity generation has been carefully negotiated amongst all of the members uh, who have a desire to work uh, to put together a new formula for our country. Unfortunately, there are many states in the Union that have no renewable electricity uh, standards at all. There are others that have standards that are all across the map. What we're trying to do here is to put together a national plan, a plan that we need for our own national security, for job creation, and to deal with this serious issue of climate change. It's not a standard that is one that is beyond the reach of any one of the states. That's why we made our definition so inclusive. That's why the definition of wind and solar and biomass and geothermal and a waste are so broad so that it is possible for every state to meet the standard uh, so that we can put in place a plan to protect our country. So I can't think of something that would go right to the heart of this uh, uh, in terms of the plan that we put together. We're sending a signal to new energy developers all across the country. You know. We're sending a signal to investors okay. all across the country, and by the way, all across the world, to look to the United States to invest in this new generation of renewable energy technologies. Mm -hmm. They need the certainty. They need the predictability of knowing what this national marketplace is going to look like. And the amendment by the gentleman from Pennsylvania will just cut the legs out from under it. It will allow for, once again, uh, this uh, a cacophony of different standards on no standards to exist. Yes, we want individual states to have their own standards. And yes, we want them to be even higher. And in many states, they will be higher than the standard that we have in this law. But we cannot allow uh, for this to continue in a way that does not signal to the investing uh, community, to the entrepreneurial community, uh, to the technological community uh, that there is not a, a consistent long-term plan in place for people to invest in. Now, I know Mr. McNerney down here uh, is an expert on these issues. And would you like to speak to that issue, Mr. McNerney, uh, the issue of the need to create this national predictable marketplace for renewable uh, uh, electricity? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I spent uh, 20 years or more developing wind energy technology. and. What happens in the market is that 
if the uh, if the government uh, support or government uh, subsidies are, are insecure or fluctuate, then uh, those markets go away. People, investors, need to know uh, what the market's going to look like to be able to put their money into uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, when that doesn't happen, uh, the technology will go overseas. Technology that we developed in this country uh, will go overseas and, and be built and be uh, manufactured and be sold, uh, and profits will go uh, overseas in those jobs with them. So uh, we need a, a, a consistent, well uh, understood and predictable uh, government position on this, uh, on these uh, issues and support. And if we don't have it, I'm afraid we're going to be losing jobs rather than gaining them. So uh, I think the uh, the uh, chairman and I I, uh, I I thank the gentleman. Yield back. The gentleman knows this uh, field well. If we want the investment in these new technologies, if we want to be exporting these new technologies overseas rather than importing them from other countries that are going to go too far ahead of us, then vote no on the Pitts Amendment. We've had five minutes of debate on each side. Are we ready for the question, Mr. Two Mr. minutes. Uh, I'd recognize Let's the gentleman for three minutes, and I hope he'll yield some time to Mr. Murphy. I'll do that. Um, we're going to give some of these allowances to the states to distribute as they see fit. We're going to give the authority to the state PUCs to regulate and make sure that the local distribution companies in each state pass through the rebates, but we're not willing to give the states the authority to have a different definition of what's renewable. Um, what this tells me is that this carefully crafted compromise we keep hearing about uh, is a compromise in political correctness where only the people on the majority side in the Energy and Commerce Committee know what's right for the entire American economy. Well. There's some really, really bright folks on the majority side in this committee, and almost every one of them, well, in fact, every one of them that I know is a good, I consider to be a good friend and a very capable legislator. Some of the newer members I don't know very well, but I'm sure they're just as qualified. But as bright and as capable and as sincere as the majority is, not all knowledge in the country is on the right side uh, of this committee dais. And what Mr. Pitts is saying is if a state has a renewable portfolio standard in existence, let it be the standard in that state for this section of the bill. If a state doesn't, then the, the definitions in the bill are the definitions for those particular states that don't have it. That's all it does. It's taking the logic and the policy that the majority has put together, but it's simply saying let's take advantage of differences by state and use, if they have a renewable electricity standard, let's let that definition apply. I don't, I think that's common sense. Gentlemen, I would yield. hope we accept it. I'd be happy to yield to this. I just want to point out that what we did in this renewable portfolio provision is to have a standard for the whole country, but to recognize the regional differences. And we did that in the proposal that we had before us. And I think uh, if we would uh, change that along the lines of this amendment, I th it would do harm to what we're trying to accomplish, which is to produce more renewable fuels. So uh, th that uh, we'd let the governor of a state certify that the state can't meet the renewable requirement of 15 uh, percent. And that r way the state can play a role. We let the states go higher than the national standard. But we have a national standard. And uh, we think it's important to have it. Well, you, re, uh, reclaiming what little time I have, well, Washington doesn't always know best, even on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I'm going to yield a little Would bit. Would you gentlemen's right in Texas and California don't always know best either. <laughs> Mr. Murphy, for my last uh, six seconds. No, I'm going to yield to Mr. Murphy. How much time would you like, Mr. Murphy? Two minutes. Gentlemen's recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, let me add to this. I know that we need base load of energy. Uh, it's not the wind is great, solar is great, but as they say, when the wind don't blow, the lights don't glow, and when the sun ain't bright, the bulbs don't light. What we have to have is a base load. And I know in our state, our good Governor Rendell, former head of the DNC, was wise enough to say uh, we could use waste coal as part of this. With uh, There's 250,000 acres of abandoned mine lands and 2,200 miles of streams impaired by polluted mine drainage, which puts aluminum and manganese and iron into our streams and makes them lifeless. 
And what the state uh, legislature did in Pennsylvania, working with the governor's office, they said, let's use waste coal. It actually emits less, uh, has less emissions than uh, regular coal-fired power plants, and uh, I'd like to see us do that. Now, I know this bill does allow municipal waste, and that's good. But let's understand that uh, coal is also, uh, also has its waste from these huge gob piles that are like mountains and areas. And this is why we'd like to see as part of this to allow the states to include as part of what they have done in their wisdom uh, and waste coal being among them, I think that that would help immensely. Uh, whether that's already in the bill, Mr. Chairman, that would allow uh, our Governor Rendell to ask for a waiver to include waste coal, uh, perhaps we can clarify that. But I believe this amendment would give us some uh, latitude to allow that to happen anyway. So the states have already made some actions towards uh, cleaning up our environment with uh, these kind of things uh, can go into place. But I yield back the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. We'll now proceed to a vote. Uh, I'd like to see if we could take this on a voice vote. We'll, we'll ask for the yeas and noes by Mr. Chairman. Voice. I'd like a recorded vote, please. Okay. We'll go to a recorded vote. <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. No. Mr. Dingle votes no. <clears throat> Mr. Markey. <Yes. clears throat> Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. <coughs> Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Gett. No. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps. No, sorry. That's right. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. No. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Hey, Pat. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. What, what title of the bill was? Um, Mr. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Okay. Yeah, combined efficiency and Mr. Weiner. Standard. Mr. Weiner, no. Just give you a little Mr. Matheson. Okay. Here's Mr. Time. Butterfield. So we Mr. Butterfield votes no. Yeah. Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Barrow. Oh. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Mc, Mr. McNerney. No. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. No. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer, aye. 
Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. 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 Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? And then the clerk will tally the vote. Clerk, uh, ready to announce the vote? Yes, sir. At the, on that vote, Mr. Chairman, the ayes were 23, the nays were 31. Well, it is a different vote than the last one. 23 to 23 31. ayes, 31 nays, the amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Barton? I have an amendment at the desk. It's called the Barton Substitute. Barton Substitute Amendment. Clerk will report the amendment. Yeah. Chairman, reserve a point of order. A uh, point of order is reserved. Substitute amendment offered by Mr. Barton of Texas. Mr. Chairman, in I am going to dispense, ask unanimous consent in a minute to dispense with the reading of the amendment. But since we do have a speed reader, and I saw that he was practicing his speed reading, I would uh, ask that we begin to read this amendment, but I promise you within two to three minutes, I will ask to suspend the reading of the amendment. The uh, clerk will read the bill. I want the speed reader to read the bill, not the, the, clerk. the speed reader clerk will read the bill. Before you begin the reading, have you been practicing the reading of this particular amendment? Uh, I just got it a, a couple minutes ago. Did you look it over? This version of it. Did, did you look it over? This version of it? I went over it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I want him to read in a Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> in lieu of the matter proposed to be inserted by me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's have order. Uh, the the, the uh, amendment offered by Mr. Borton is before us. 
And uh, rather than ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading, the rules require that the amendment be read. The clerk will read the bill. In lieu of the matter proposed to be inserted by the amendment offered by blank, insert the following section one short, short title. Now listen table to of contents, a short title. The act may be cited as the Energy Produc Production Innovation and Conservation Act. B table of contents. Table of contents for the act is as follows. Section one, short title and table of contents. Title one, clean energy standards. Section 101, federal clean energy standard. Ten, title two, American energy. Subtitle A, conservation and efficiency. Chapter one, tapping in it. America's ingenuity and creativity. Section 201, definition. Section 202, statement of policy. Section 203, price authority. Section 204, eligibility. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask. I ask unanimous consent that the reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that he take the time to give your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman from Texas. Yeah, for what is your? Uh, could could you inform us? <laughs> uh, my, name, my name is Douglas Wilder. Douglas Wilder, and if anybody in the country wants to hire a speed reader, are you available? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Just work. Bill has created one job. This is a lot of energy for one job. And the clerk lost hers. <laughs> okay. Committee will please come to order. Mr. Barton's recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I just felt that since you went to all that trouble that we ought to at least get some benefit of the uh, young man's expertise. If, if, he, if he'll just work on his accent a little bit, he'll have a bright future. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this is the, uh, the Republican substitute. I, I want to say up front that it's, it's not the substitute in its entirety. It is only those portions of the substitute that are germane to this committee's jurisdiction. So our production package uh, and some of the tax uh, tax sections are not in this substitute because they were not germane, and we didn't want a point of order on germaneness to be lodged against the bill. But to but it is comprehensive. Um, I should say that what Congressman Inslee said several nights ago, um, where he was very eloquent in trying to move the country in a new direction, um, this, this substitute in any other Congress would be considered very progressive, uh, very moderate, uh, but because it still attempts to use the market mechanism um, and the price mechanism to let people make free choices on which forms of energy to use and how to use them, um, uh, it, is, it is not uh, as directive and invasive uh, by government uh, as the pending legislation. For example, the substitute amendment does not have a cap and trade program. We don't need to regurgitate um, the reasons that those of us on our sides of the aisle think that that's a, uh, an unacceptable idea. But we do accept that um, it would be better for the economy if we were uh, less carbon intensive. And so instead of a um, cap and trade mechanism that's very complicated, um, we take a page out of, the pen, out of the current law in the Clean Air Act and simply set a performance standard for new coal plants uh, and uh, natural gas plants based on existing technology, um, we set a limit on the amount of CO2 that those um, plants uh, can emit. It starts for coal plants at 2,000 pounds per megawatt uh, and for natural gas plants at 1,100 pounds per megawatt. Those are both standards that can be met with existing technology and um, over time those standards uh, are decreased. The standards only apply to, to new plant generation. Uh, for existing plants, we create a, a, a tax incentive, although that is not actually a part of this amendment because it wouldn't be germane. But if you want to go in and retrofit an existing power plant and make it more efficient so that it meets or exceeds that standard that I just enunciated by at least 5 percent, then they would get accelerated depreciation. So we take a uh, a carrot approach. We set a, 
a standard on CO2 based on existing technology. Um, we do include the voucher language on, on uh, carbon capture, sequestration, and conversion so that we do support the concept in the bill to do the R&D for uh, CCS technology. Um, but if, if a plant can meet or exceed these new standards, we use the incentives to move, move our older plants into the cleaner um, era. Uh, on the renewable electricity standard, um, we adopt the language where it's based on emissions. It's not based on, on some what I consider to be a political correctness test. Uh, so we do have a, a clean energy standard that includes hydro. Uh, it includes clean coal technology. It includes nuclear. We don't play games between old and new. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, if we want a less carbon intensive economy, we want less emissions, we think a clean energy standard ought to encompass everything that's, that's, that's truly clean. We have a transmission siting title, which the current bill uh, does not have. Now, my understanding is that Mr. Inslee is still working to try to come up with some sort of a transmission uh, section that may be offered in the manager's amendment. I don't know if that's true or not, but the Republican alternative does have a transmission section. We, uh, uh, we, we, we try to uh, uh, do things that help in the direction that the um, authors of the pending legislation are trying to do, but we try to do it uh, without uh, negatively impacting the economy. We do have the um, Blackburn language on uh, uh, Massachusetts versus EPA. Uh, if I had to point to one of the major shortfalls of the existing pending bill that Mr. Waxman and Mr. Markey has put together is that they don't exempt um, and don't repeal that, that court case. If the bill that's before us becomes law, you're going to have a double jeopardy situation where we have all of the statutory language in the bill, but we also have the regulatory approach because of the court case. And I, I don't think we ought to put the American economy into, into dual uh, jeopardy. Gentlemen's time has expired. Do you wish additional time? Can I have one additional minute? Without objection. I thank the gentleman. Um, so just in summary, this, this um, we, all, we have a domestic reforestation section. Uh, we do have Mr. Waldron's biomass language in our substitute. So uh, it is comprehensive. Uh, it would work. I think it would be good law if it were to become law. Uh, for those that don't think the current bill uh, in its current form is, is acceptable, I would ask that you to sincerely take a look at this. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields it back his time. The chair recognizes Mr. Markey. I thank the, <clears throat> I thank the uh, chair very much. The votes that we are about to take are uh, the most important energy votes in a generation. In a few moments, we will choose whether or not to adopt the Republican substitute for the plan that we have had before us this week. Whether we want America to take the lead in developing the clean energy technologies that will reinvigorate our economy or continue falling behind further internationally. Whether we want to send a message to OPEC that we are finally serious about breaking our dependence upon imported oil, tired of sending Americans' dollars overseas. Whether we will curb the heat-trapping emissions that are threatening our planet or wreck our climate for future generations. The American people are overwhelmingly calling for a new direction. They are calling for this Congress to take action in a way that changes forever our relationship with that imported oil, with the loss of jobs overseas, with the pollution which is causing greenhouse gas warming on our planet. This substitute would eviscerate the renewable electricity standard. 
which is included in our legislation, which is at the heart of this plan to unleash a technological revolution, to unleash trillions of dollars of investment ready to go in all of the new technologies uh, that uh, can be used in order to break our dependence upon imported oil and chart our course towards a new clean, green energy job future. The bill as well, when it sets its performance standards for coal, uses a standard that could have been met in 1980. What we have done in this legislation, in conjunction with the utility industry, in conjunction with the coal miners, and led by Mr. Boucher, is to create a brand new paradigm where we will begin to make the investment in new coal technology and carbon capture and sequestration technology that will forever change the relationship uh, between our planet and the burning of coal. The amendment would also undermine the benefits that the underlying bill will realize through energy efficiency by removing the incentives for utilities to implement efficiency programs. And worse yet, the substitute would create an incentive for utilities to increase consumer energy consumption. And finally, and the gentleman from Texas made reference to this, the, leg the substitute would repeal Massachusetts versus EPA, the most important Supreme Court decision on the subject of the environment in history, in a law which helped to forge the compromise which was reached and announced on the White House lawn just two days ago between the automotive industry, the auto workers, and the American people. It would be a huge mistake to adopt the Republican substitute. I'd like to yield back to the gentleman from California uh, on this because I think uh, uh, his words on this subject, on this substitute, uh, are important for, uh, to be recorded. Well, I thank you for yielding to me, and you have some time. There may be other members who want that last minute. But at, at this last minute of consideration on this uh, amendment, substitute amendment, I urge my colleagues to defeat it. Uh, it would replace a bill that has, is supported by a very long list of public interest groups, environmental groups, who have put an enormous amount of energy into getting this legislation uh, to the point where it is today. It would reject the input from some of the leaders in American industry who have said that uh, we need to do the kinds of things that our legislation would provide, a, a, an incentive for businesses to limit carbon emissions, a bill that can create more jobs, and a real reduction in the pollution that is causing global warming. So I would urge my colleagues to uh, vote against the substitute and to vote for uh, passage of the uh, underlying bill. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired, and the chair would proceed now to ask the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Green. Ms. DeGette. Ms. DeGette votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. 
Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Hall? Do you want to vote? Okay. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Mr. Shattuck passes. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich, no. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden passes. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Is he here? Where is he? Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Pallone. Is he here? I'm sorry. I thought it was here. <coughs> Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. I think so. Yes, yeah, she voted very softly. Ms. Harmon, you go. 
Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Have all members responded to the uh, call of the roll? <laughs> if so, see the clerk tallying the vote, and we'll have it announced as soon as that tally is complete. Clerk will announce the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 19 ayes, 35 noes, and two present. Two voting present. Two voting present. 19 ayes, 35 five no. noes, and two present. Two the, voting present. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Braley, you have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Desk, Chairman. But without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the spirit of bipartisanship rarely seen in the Big 12 Conference, I am pleased to offer an amendment with Mr. Terry of Nebraska. And this amendment uh, will insert on page 122 after line 18 uh, language to provide for loan guarantees to construct renewable fuel pipelines as part of Section 1701 of the Energy Policy Act of 2001. And one of the things we do know is that there is a tremendous demand for biofuels on both coasts, and yet there is a shortage of supply. One of the things that we have learned is that CO2 emissions are reduced by 30 percent when comparing biofuels transported by pipelines versus rail cars, and 87 percent when comparing pipelines to trucks. So this very simple amendment will add language to provide for pipelines that carry renewable fuels to be part of the loan guarantee program pre that it currently exists. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Rather than do that, would you yield to me just I to, would be happy to yield to uh, you. Thank you and Mr. Terry for your bipartisan amendment. You want to ensure that the construction of pipeline infrastructure is available for renewable fuels and that uh, they qualify for loan guarantees under Title 17. Okay. Yeah, I think you've worked together to develop a straightforward, sensible provision that would update right. Title 17. I think this uh, amendment supports key goals of this legislation. It would improve America's energy security and create clean energy jobs, and I thank you for it. Encourage members to support it. Mr. Chairman, uh, do you yield or gentlemen yield? Mr. Braley has the time. Who has the time? Mr. Braley has the time. Mr. Braley, you yield? I'd be happy to yield to the ranking member. Uh, I know this is uh, pipelines only for renewable fuels, uh, and I haven't read the whole amendment, but I know we had a debate earlier on, on the life cycle of biofuels. Is there anything in here that would limit it to uh, uh, biofuels that, that have a life cycle that limit greenhouse gases? The change to the bill in the amendment simply amends the definition of renewable fuel uh, to include that of the Clean Air Act and adding to it ethanol and biodiesel. What does this mean? Any entity. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Barton. Five minutes. I won't take five minutes. I'm simply, I want to ask one question of counsel on page six, line four, eminent domain authority, when, enti when any entity in the carrying out of the project does that mean a private entity has eminent domain authority? On page six, line four, it says, line three says eminent domain authority, and it says when any entity in the carrying out of a project described in paragraph one, and then it goes through a long list of things. Um, and it says that they can uh, exercise the right of eminent domain in the district court of the United States for the district in which such property may be located. So my question is, are we given the right of government eminent domain to private entities? I've been informed that the wrong copy, the wrong version of this amendment has been distributed. So if the gentleman would withhold his question, let's see if what your concern is is in the, in the actual amendment. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, we've gone from six pages to uh, 
basically one page. Well, that's uh, so, um, that's an improvement. It's it's movement in the right direction. Um, let me. So so the first one that was handed out is wrong. That's that's correct. All right. Can I suspend just for thirty seconds yes, to read this? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have objections to the uh, clean amendment. The, um, the corrected amendment is before us without objection. That will be uh, the amendment under consideration. And it is a straightforward amendment that Mr. Braley and Mr. Terry had proposed, which uh, I think meets with uh, support from both sides of the aisle. All those in favor of the uh, Braley and Terry amendments say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call up uh, three amendments um, on block. Amendment number five, which is an amendment I should have my name on. Uh, amendment number 23, which is an amendment for Mr. Stearns. And amendment number 66 for Mr. Pitts. And we would uh, like to present those uh, within the time limit and uh, as one uh, on block. Without objection. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Okay, without objection, the three amendments will be considered in block. And further, without objection, the three amendments will be considered as read. And the uh, gentleman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Let me first start with the uh, amendment number five, the amendment I have. This is an amendment where. Uh, th this simply try to, would strike the additional performance standards for coal under this legislation. Mr. Chairman, by additional uh, performance standards, uh, uh, your, your bill, your bill, the bill that you and Mr. Markey have, amends the Clean Air Act to create performance standards for new coal-fueled uh, power plants. Section 116 of the bill imposes an, as an, an additional admission stand limit on new coal-fired generating facilities. That section requires that, in addition to the cap on admissions opposed under the cap and trade part of the bill, new coal-fired facilities must reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 50 percent if they're permitted if, if they were permitted between 2009 and 2020, and by 65 percent if permitted after 2020. Uh, this is an additional standard. Uh, this uh, amendment would just simply create uniformity uh, as to how coal and other uh, uh, electric generating units are treated. Uh, the performance standards imposed on natural gas, for instance, would be the same standard on coal if this amendment uh, was allowed. And uh, I'd yield uh, time to Mr. Stearns. Uh, I thank my colleague. Uh, the amendment I have, my colleagues, is dealing with carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, to commercially develop this, we need to have a liability framework must be in place to encourage investment. Mr. Boucher talked about uh, relative to carbon capture and sequestration. He's talking about the Pitts Amendment. Well, if we're going to go ahead, as Mr. Waxman, the chairman, talked about with carbon uh, fuel burning uh, plants, then we need to have carbon capture and sequestration liability reform uh, framework in place. So the amendment authorized the EPA to develop and promulgate regulations for states to apply be approved for and administer a state carbon dioxide storage program and allows for an approved state regulatory agency to establish all rules and regulation with respect to the administration and enforcement of such a program. Each story, storage operator will be required by the state regulatory agency or the administrator to have and maintain financial assurance necessary to cover public liability claims relating to the storage facility. So important if we're going to go forward with carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, upon the issuance of a certificate of completion of injection operations by the state regulatory agency, then the administer, administrator will simply be vested with complete and absolute title and ownership of the storage facility and any stored carbon dioxide at the facility. Um, at this point, where a completion certificate is issued, the storage operator and all generators of any injected carbon dioxide will no longer have further liability associated with the project and any performance bonds posted by the storage operator will simply be released. Continuing monitoring of the storage facility 
including remediation of any well leakage, will become at this point the responsibility of the administrator. So for each fiscal year, the administrator will collect an annual assessment from each storage operator that has not obtained a certificate of completion of injection operation. Uh, and I uh, yield uh, the rest of my balance to Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm offering an amendment that merely adds coal and natural gas that are, is equipped with CCS technology to the definition of the renewable energy resource. Adding CCS coal and natural gas eliminates regional advantages and disadvantages that I believe currently exist in the renewable electricity standard. My state of Pennsylvania is 58 percent dependent on the use of coal for electricity generation and nationally natural gas accounts for 21.6 percent of the energy we use. Therefore, states that rely heavily on coal and natural gas will be heavily penalized if after the deployment of CCS, they are not counted in the renewable electricity standard. Adding CCS coal and natural gas to the RES would keep electric bills lower for families across the nation. It would help avoid reliability problems that occur when relying too heavily on intermittent renewables like wind and solar. And CCS coal and natural gas would be zero emission sources of electricity. It just makes sense that they be added to the RES. With that, I yield back. So, Chairman, I withdraw my reservation. Gentlelady withdraws this reservation. Gentlemen, yield back his time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just point out that uh, coal is essential to many of our states in Missouri. Uh, more than 80 percent of our electricity is generated by coal. It powers, as Mr. Pitts said, nearly 50 percent of all the electricity in the country. We have almost 30 percent of the global coal reserves, and uh, I hope we can uh, strike a balance between continuing to use fossil fuels while developing new energy technologies, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair yields to Mr. Markey. I thank you. Um, first of all, just let me say that um, this legislation does more for coal's future than any piece of legislation in a generation. Uh, it is going to provide the multi-billion dollar funding of the research, development and deployment of the carbon capture and sequestration technology uh, that will make it possible for coal uh, to continue uh, to prosper in a carbon constrained world. That is the objective of all of those sections that Mr. Boucher and other members uh, negotiated uh, and uh, ultimately had included in this legislation, tens of billions of dollars to accomplish that goal. But even with all that said and done, coal is not a renewable. Coal is consumed in the actual production of the electricity uh, which is created. That is why we have a separate section, a separate section for renewables. Renewables have their own section in the legislation, and that is so that we can create a separate set of incentives for the development, not of one or two, but potentially dozens of new technologies uh, that can complement coal and nuclear and hydro and natural gas as a means of generating electricity in our country, but to be able then to export those new technologies as we hope to export the carbon capture and sequestration technology that we uh, develop under the coal sections of this bill. But to merge two separate concepts, coal, a non-renewable, although ultimately with a little bit of, of scientific and technological breakthrough, a low carbon emitting technology, yes, and to merge that with renewable technologies which are uh, going to be incentivized in a different part of the legislation uh, would be to uh, pervert uh, the, uh, the goals that we have for both. And so right now I think it is pretty clear uh, what is happening. Uh, there is an all-out assault here uh, on the renewables standards in this bill. Uh, and I understand the, uh, the historic uh, opposition uh, that, uh, that uh, has been raised against it. Uh, but no longer is it possible to say that this, that, that, uh, that uh, we are attempting to harm the coal industry because that, would not, that is not true. And this legislation is demonstrable evidence of that. 
Uh, I do not think that we could receive the uh, support of the mine workers uh, if they believed that. Uh, of Mr. Boucher and the coal state members uh, who have negotiated these provisions. So I urge in the strongest possible uh, uh, terms uh, the rejection of this amendment. Uh, otherwise, I am afraid uh, we would no longer have our balanced uh, policy, but we would have our renewable electricity standal, uh, standard gobbled up by coal, even if it was clean coal. We don't have to do that. Well, we, the have way, we have a way here in this legislation uh, of ensuring that we're doing both. And that ultimately is what the American people want us to do. Well, the gentleman, I, yield. I urge, I urge uh, a no vote on this uh, legislation. And uh, let me, can, may I yield to the gentleman from, uh, from Pennsylvania on this issue, Mr. Doyle? Would the gentleman yield to me first? I'd be, uh, I'd be glad to yield. And then maybe uh, to uh, the other members who seek recognition. Uh, these performance standards are necessary to level the playing field, prevent a large emissions legacy from uncontrolled plants, and to ensure that the use of revenues for CCS bonus allowances is wise and pays off. The new subsidies ensure that CCS is a viable option for developers, and the new source performance standard ensures that a clear signal is sent to banks and utilities that CCS is the technology of choice when it comes to coal. So I would join you in urging a defeat of this amendment. Will the gentleman yield? I thank the gentleman. And I'll be glad to yield. Uh, will the gentleman from Massachusetts perhaps uh, help me out? Wouldn't you agree that to go ahead with uh, carbon capture and sequestration that we have to commercially develop a liability framework to encourage this investment? Without that liability framework, no one's going to uh, expend the capital? Okay. Actually, at our hearing, which I think the gentleman was at, the insurance industry testified that they are actually developing private sector insurance uh, to cover this entire area. And I think we should allow the private sector insurance uh, industry uh, to first have an opportunity to develop uh, their own approach. All time has expired on the amendment. Do you want to vote, sir? Uh, now we will have a recorded vote on the three amendments en bloc, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. Ms. Deget. Ms. Deget, no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. No. Ms. Harmon, no. <coughs> Ms. Joukowsky. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Uh, no. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melanson. No. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Barrow. No. 
Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill votes no. Ms. Matsui, Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen, Ms. Castor, Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Sarbanes, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch votes, votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton, aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Mr. Boyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack votes aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy, Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Kowski. Mr. Kowski, no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Have all members responded to the vote? Ms. Christensen? Not, not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Christensen votes no. <coughs> Clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 23 ayes and 33 noes. 23 ayes, 33 noes. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. Uh, who seeks recognition? Mr. Weiner, do you have an amendment at the desk? Amendment at the desk, yes, I do. Uh, do we need the speed reader, or can we get unanimous consent uh, that it be considered as read? Consent it be considered as read for the purposes of debate and passage. 
Without objection, that'll be the order. Gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I don't think I'll take the, the full five minutes. The Energy Star Indicia is one of the most recognizable ones in consumer life, except because of, uh, of lack of attention on the part of Congress and EPA, it has had its meaning diluted over the course of time. The, the Energy Star label was envisioned by the EPA to accommodate approximately the best 25 percent of products, the most energy efficient ones, would get the Energy Star logo. Uh, in addition to the other things we're doing in this bill, including the best in class language that Ms. Harmon uh, was able to draft, it is time we updated the Energy Star certification system. Right now, uh, an overwhelming number of appliances have that indicia because the standards haven't been kept up. For example, 95 percent, 92 percent of dishwashers qualify for the Energy Star, 60 percent of dehumidifiers because the standards haven't been updated year by year. Um, another problem that we have is that under the Energy Star system, the appliance manufacturers provide all of the data, and according to a report by Consumers Union, it gives the manufacturers too many opportunities to game the system. They pointed to an example of someone of a company that submitted a refrigerator for rating, and they tested it without the ice maker running. It qualified for the Energy Star rating that way, and when it was reported that, the, that it should have been, had the ice maker uh, running, it, it was not compliant. The, uh, the, letters, the amendment that I'm offering updates the, the program in a couple of ways. One, it requires the EPA uh, update their standards more frequently every three years rather than every seven years. Second, it requires that the EPA every once in a while do some spot testing to make sure the manufacturers are on the level. Uh, third, it, it requires that manufacturers submit their most current appliances for testing and don't hold those back for fear that it will dilute the energy efficiency standards of older appliances. What sometimes happens is that if a company has something in development, they intentionally hold it back from getting its rating because they don't want to make it seem like the ones that are on the shelves are less energy compliant, again, diluting the value of the Energy Star system. One thing we don't do in this amendment that I would have liked to do is make the Energy Star label mean something relative to other Energy Star products. Would the gentleman yield for a question? Uh, sure. I would, can I just do this, this one final point here? This, this, okay. Yeah, maybe I should give this a shot. Yes, I, I'd be glad to yield. <laughs> I, want to, I, I want to know if you were a Yankee fan or a Met fan. I'm but a Met fan, sir. Ask that. Um, we don't have a problem with the, uh, the policy. We have a little bit of a question about the 10 million authorization, what's that number based on? The, the number is based on a, a ballpark of what EPA thought it would take to go and do some of these spot tests, to do the, the update the regulations more frequently, and do the part of the, of the amendment that I was just going to describe, which tells them to go in and study whether or not they should go to a system that allows the Energy Star label to be more communicative by making one relative to others, like a different color or a different Energy Star 1, 2, or 3, so that consumers can look at two refrigerators, see two Energy Star indicias, and be able to determine which one is more or less energy efficient. They said it's going to require them some money. I happen to disagree, Mr. Chairman. I, I, don't, I don't believe it will well, cost them that much money, but that's what they said, and in, in, in the wisdom of staff, we included a dollar amount since we're in the process. No, I, I, thank, I, I thank you for using a real number instead of such sums. Would, would, you, would you ask? Unanimous consent to change it to five million, and then if you if you yourself have some concerns about well, it, I I I I I'd be, be be glad if if you made that unanimous consent request, I wouldn't object, and I'd leave it to the wisdom of the chairman to decide whether he should. And then I would ask unanimous consent that the uh, gentleman's amendment be amended to authorize five million per year as opposed to ten million. Reserving the right to object. If, if, this is, if, if this is successful, we can, can we'll I, accept it. Terrific. Uh, I, I will withdraw my reservation. Mr. Chairman, can Chairman. who has the time? The, Mr. Weiner has the time. Do, Mr. Would you Weiner, yield to I, some? The, well, I, it's, it's, it's under unanimous consent request. I've, I've, well, the, the it's, unanimous consent is agreed to. Uh, uh, and I, 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 I yield to the gentlelady from California. Well, I, I, uh, I support the amendment uh, as amended or not amended. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to say that uh, Mr. Weiner talked to me first about this to make sure that nothing he was doing here would interfere with several provisions that are in our bill, including the, uh, the, the so-called cash for clunker appliances provision and uh, also the best in class uh, uh, idea that we have. 
And I don't think this does interfere. I think he is right uh, that the Energy Star label is, uh, is not uh, awarded as carefully as it should be. And our goal here is to promote efficiency. And by doing this study and by seeing whether uh, there are improvements in the way we label things, I think uh, it's uh, a win for um, uh, reducing carbon emissions and certainly a win for informing consumers uh, uh, fully about uh, what they are purchasing. So I just want to congratulate the gentleman for offering this amendment. I think I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, would you yield to Mr. Green? Did you want? Uh, I don't have any time, Ms. but I'd be glad to yield to Mr. Green. Mr. Chairman, uh, my concern, though, is since it was a ballpark figure, were we talking about the new Yankee Stadium? That $5 million wouldn't even buy a shutter. Gentlemen's time has expired. That question will have to be uh, put on the table. Uh, all those in favor of the Wiener Amendment say aye. Aye. aye oppose no. no. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. We'll now recognize Mr. a Chairman. member, another member Mr. Chairman. seeks recognition. Mr. Boyer, do you have an amendment? Mr. Chairman, I have, uh, I have two amendments, and uh, I will do them in block if you're willing to accept both of these amendments. <laughs> so, if uh, the best way to handle this, and bonk does not mean in blind. <laughs> well, I, I'm I, not prepared to accept well, anything until just, I've seen it. Do you want to offer that? These are, these are uh, two very good amendments, and it's one in which I've worked not only with your staff but also with Mr. Boucher. One is the amendment number 20, and the other is an amendment with with Greg Walden with regard to mature forests. We've had good discussions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to the, the uh, mature forest issues, and some of your members have also worked with our members on an amendment. And uh, I'll do them both in block if you're willing to take them both in block. Well, I, I have to look at them first, and I'm not prepared to say that. Do you want to offer them in block and we'll discuss it, or do you want to offer them separately? Well, I guess one of those amendments. Let me, I, do it, let me do it separately then. That'll give you a chance to look at them, and then you'll, you'll have the I'll opportunity to tell you what, do it in block. Individually. Let's do it in. in Nope. Let's do them together. We'll do them together. And what are you going to do? Just do it already. Honestly. Did you want to do this together to save time? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and pass out both amendments, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'll proceed to discuss, if you like. The gentleman has two amendments. We will consider and block without objection. And I'd like, uh, and then if you without objection, we'll consider them both read. Mr. And Chairman, like, reserving then, a point of order. And a point of order is reserved by the gentleman from Michigan. And I would like to recognize Mr. Boyer for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then, uh, you know, if you disagree with one of them, we can uh, okay. bifurcate them no differently what we had done before with Mr. Barton. The, the issue with regard to the uh, uh, interconnection and net metering is an issue that Mr. Boucher and I have worked on together since 2005. And uh, right now, I'd like for the members to know over the last two years, please, may I shut the, thank you. We have, over the last two years, we've been, we have a lot of renewable energy projects ongoing within the VA and DOD. So with regard to the VA, we have, uh, um, with regard to solar alone, there are uh, 54, uh, no, strike that. With regard to renewable energy projects, there are 54, 38 eight of which are solar, 16 of which are geothermal and wind turbine. Uh, we have 14 that are actually going to be funded in this year's appropriation. There are, of the 22 that I've been able to get in the uh, uh, work with the secretary. Gentlemen, yield to me. Yes, sir. Uh, you have two amendments, one of which we uh, support, so uh, you may not want to talk at length about it. That's right. the net metering amendment for federal agencies. We support that amendment. The Very other well. one uh, that you're offering with Mr. Walden is problematic, so perhaps you can spend some time talking about that one. Very well. See if you can convince us. Very well. I want to thank Mr. Boucher for his work, and I'll, I'll work with you on further issues that you and I have. With regard to uh, a mature forest uh, stands, uh, I brought up the discussion with, the, with the, my colleagues, uh, the drive that I took uh, from Denver up to Breckenridge and then to Vail. And uh, what I've learned is that you have over 2 million acres of the lodgepole pines forest in Colorado. Uh, the pine beetle has, has killed this forest. And, and over 500,000 acres of the contiguous areas in southern Wyoming. And it is, it is headed to Aspen. And uh, 
uh, I believe that this is a, a good amendment. It's very narrowly tailored. I want to yield to the gentleman, Mr. Walden, uh, who's known as Mr. Woody. <laughs> Great. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Ah, it's been a wonderful time. That's not what I meant. <laughs> I don't, I'm just, we're going to talk about biomass here. And I just want to tell you that uh, I just got some numbers. Um, in Colorado, for example, there are nearly 7 million acres of lands that are considered uh, uh, a mature stand forests, much would, like what you would, saw in that photo on the, uh, in the Colorado mountains. It's behind you. That would be off limits um, because of the term in this bill that lacks any scientific basis. And I say that, I want to enter into the record two letters, one from the Society of American Foresters where they say the exclusion of the mature stands on federal lands is pr extremely problematic. Um, they go on to say in the end, excluding these lands has no basis in science. For those who have cared about science, here are the scientists. No basis in science. I ask unanimous consent that be entered into the record. The second is from the National Association of Forest Service Retirees. And it says that essential treatments to maintain the health and resilience of forest stands are not limited to just removal of small, non-commercial trees. Throughout stand development, trees become crowded, diseased, or insect infected. They go on. Both very. Th these are the professionals in the forestry business, um, and we should listen to them. Now let me, let me just point out that there's nothing in this bill that will prevent the treatment of these trees from being removed. Let me make that clear. There's nothing in here that prevents this forest from being treated. Here's what the language mature stand says, however, is that all the material they take out of there will not count if it's burned in a new, efficient, new technology, new science-based, energy-generating facility that's bio because it came off a mature stand. So you know what they're going to do with it, most likely? They're going to pile it up on the ground, wait till winter, and burn it. They call that a slash burn. They're going to burn it. They're going to just pile it up out here, wait till winter, and they're going to burn it, most likely. That's what they do when they do thinning. What we're saying is, why don't you take that material, chop it up, make it into woody biomass, bricks, bricks like this, pucks like I had the other day, replace coal, generate electricity, create heat sources, and do it in a way that doesn't emit greenhouse gases, that is highly efficient, and that produces renewable energy. I'd like to reclaim my time. In Colorado State University, what they're saying is if we don't go in and do these selective cuts, Within the next three to five years, Colorado's mature lodgepole pine trees will be gone. So being able to go in and do these selective cuts, manage the forest in a very smart and efficient manner is good conservation, and that's what we're trying to do, and then to use them for woody biomass. I think it's a good amendment. That I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Any, wish, uh, any other member wish to be recognized? Mr. Stupak. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Walden and I have talked a lot about this. We went back and forth the other day on, on this, and I come from the Midwest, and, and we treat our forest a little differently than they do in the West Coast. Uh, we have the emerald ash borer, which is uh, devastating all of our ash trees in, in the Midwest. But because we're not an old growth or a mature forest where, where that is being found, we can use it underneath some of this uh, language that we have here. In the timber sale cuts, in the timber sales cuts, we can still, I still have the opinion we can use it, Greg. I know you're shaking your head no. Uh, on your western end there, I, I think the forest will treat it different. Even under, underneath the proposal we have in the legislation, at least in our forest in the Midwest, more than 92, 93 percent is available for the woody biomass of the federal lands. Now there is a small portion that is off underneath this current definition. And as I said the other day, we had negotiated this woody biomass about eight drafts and went back and forth. And, and while I, I, I know your amendment is well intended, uh, I, I would ask that we defeat it uh, and hope we could uh, defeat this amendment and just move on with it. This is an issue that I think we have to put some more time in, depending on where you are, the Midwest, the West, the, the forests are truly treated differently. And not only our timber sales, our forest management plans and all, and I think it's something we should look well, at the gentleman further. Yeah. 
But for right now, I guess I'd ask for a no vote. Would, would, would the gentleman just yield for just a second? Because we just got these data points you might be interested in. Um, there's, if you deal, there, there's at least 2 million acres of mature stands in the National Forest Service system in Michigan. Half of that will most likely, on average, not be available under the bill because of the roadless term, and half won't, of that won't be available because of the mature stand term. That's mature stands, 2 million. Um, in, in Minnesota, it's, it's a million one. Um, you know, you can go all over the country and, you know, if, if, if you're down in Georgia, it's 640,000 acres and Idaho's 10 million acres and, and you have mature stands and, and the, the bugs you talk but, about get into the mature trees. But, but and, very, very, we're cutting my time. That's course. very, right, three national forests. That two million acres is very small compared to my whole comparison of my force. Like I said, it's about at most. Well, eight percent. If if I could if I could just follow up, the the total number in the National Forest Service system. You're right. Most of the federal lands is on the on the west side west of Mississippi. Side. Half uh, there's about 150 million acres of federal Forest Service lands that's treed, that's forested, actually forested, not grasslands. Half of that is off limits because of this bill, right off the top, because it's mature stand. Half of it, right off the top. And the scientists say there's no scientific basis for that. You're going to go do the treatment. This is about what you do with what comes out. I agree. You're going to just burn it and slash as opposed to efficiently burning it without greenhouse gas emissions to any, any amount. But I understand and I, I appreciate your uh, willingness to. I'd, uh, I'd be willing to continue work on this thing, uh, Greg. Yeah, there, I realize it's. There, there's some more issues there we've got to resolve. I, I, I think you can accept it here. Um, would the gentleman accept it? Accept it and we'll work and we'll work on the details. Now, when we put together this, like I said, eight drafts, there's been a coalition of us worked on it, and, and I, I think you. But that's you the purpose of the committee process to improve the work. When product. you find that's something correct. wrong, yes, Bart. Correct. And I'm not comfortable yet. Pulling you. I think there really is differences on the way we treat it from the Midwest to the West. So let's look at those a little bit more. Uh, I'm not prepared to say you have the right answer yet on it. Gentlemen, you. Yes. Uh, the, the committee process and the markup is to resolve uh, issues, but. We've considered this issue over and over and over again in the last three days. And I think you'd be a lot more effective if you accepted the willingness of members on both sides of the aisle to just continue to work on this issue, not well, to bring it up for a vote all, every day. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I might, um, I have been in personal discussions with the gentlelady from Colorado for a day or two, mm -hmm. gentleman from Michigan. We've been in contact with the gentleman from Arkansas, been working with the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Baird. Um, there have been a lot of, this, this amendment is not the same as the one I brought up. This simply strikes the word mature, mature force. force. You know what? We've been working. I want to faith. withdraw the comments I just made. You are representing your constituents as you believe best, and you care about this issue, and you've been tenacious about it. And I, and I would like to uh, encourage people to continue working on it, see if we can resolve it. Well, but uh, I, would, I would urge that uh, we not accept this amendment now because uh, I don't think we're ready uh, to, I don't think we've reached that point where we're all feeling comfortable with it. Will the gentleman yield? I'd yield to Mr. Gett. I, I, I would like to echo uh, what the gentleman from Oregon is saying in terms of, he really is working hard on this along with members on both sides of the <coughs> aisle who are from the, West, the Rocky Mountain West and the Northwest. Um, I'm not sure we're quite there on this amendment yet, but I will say that, um, that the, the points that the gentleman from Oregon raises, the, the picture he was showing, that looks like Western Colorado with the pine beetle kill. I will also point out, though, the reason why the pine beetles are killing those forests is because the forests are warming, and so the larvae are surviving over the winters. And so, so we really do have to do something about global climate change. And I will commit, uh, win, lose, or draw with this amendment today, I will commit personally to working with the gentleman as we move forward to the floor. And I'll yield back. And, and for that commitment, I will make sure you get a Bear Mountain woody biomass block. <laughs> That's all right, but thank you for the offer. All time has expired. Uh, the chair would request that we vote I, on the uh, Boyer, Boyer the, Amendment uh, first on net Mr. Metering. Chairman? Yes. Given the spirit of commitment to work on this mature forest issue, I will withdraw the amendment and not vote on it.
All right. Thank you very Good. much. Uh, so we have one amendment to vote on, and that's the net metering amendment that Mr. Boyer has offered, uh, which uh, has a consensus behind it. All those in favor of the amendment Mr. will Mr. Chairman, I'll withdraw my point of order against uh, the amendment. The point of order is withdrawn. All those in favor of the amendment will say aye. 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 Oppose no. The ayes have it, and the amendment's agreed to. Now, uh, who seeks recognition? Mr. Stupak. Mr. Chairman, I have amendment number 71 at the desk. Without objection, the Stupak amendment number 71 will be considered as read, and gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thought it would be appropriate to bring this up as we made commitments to Mr. Wald and Mr. Booyer continue work on the Woody Biomass. This really has to deal with, uh, with a real sensitive area in there is the inclusion of iron ore under the energy intensive industry allowances. Uh, throughout the negotiations when Mr. Inslee and Mr. Doyle provisions in, in our substitute here, they did a great job. They took and care of, take, tried to take care of a number of uh, industries. About 40 of one of them who are number one uh, high users of energy and trade intensive in, uh, industry. And certainly iron ore is one of them. And in the list there that we had like 41 of them, iron ore was going to be included as part of it. However, as we started to look at it a little bit closer, when we put the eligible industrial sector, that's uh, there's supposed to be any sector that is in the manufacturing sector, but then another provision in the bill allows metal product production for the processing of iron and copper ores with subsequent steps in the process of metal manufacturing. That would presumably include iron ore. However, the iron ore industry is not defined as a manufacturing industry. So it could possibly be excluded under an incorrect interpretation. So what we're trying to do is simply to clarify what I believe is the intent of the bill as written which is that iron ore should be treated as a covered and covered in the industrial part of this uh, program, regardless of its classification as manufacturing or not. Now, we've gone round and round, and again, th this is a sensitive area with the RES and all this, and we're trying to negotiate out. It seems like every time we take a step forward, another hurdle comes up. But you've committed, Mr. Markey's committed, Mr. Ensley and Mr. Doyle have committed to continue to work on this problem. Uh, everyone thinks we had the right intent, but we just can't close up the language. And it's a little much like uh, Section 1 there, Title 1, I mean, when we brought up on the coal-fired uh, power plants, generation plants, you and I spoke about on the first day. We still have that one pending, and your staff's been trying to work that one out. We just have not been able to. So hopefully we can continue to work on these two issues, the Title 1 on, on my coal-powered fire power plants, and also this one on the iron ore. And I would, with unanimous consent, withdraw my amendment uh, based upon your willingness to continue work with us. And Mr. Doyle, Mr. Ensley, and Mr. Mark, who will get these things right. Chairman Yale, I, I, I want us to continue to work on those issues. They're important issues. And uh, I think we need to, to continue to see if we can get to the conclusion, a good conclusion on them. Will well, the thank gentleman you, Mr. Chairman. Yield? Yes. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. I, I also want to assure my friend that, uh, that we will work with him uh, between now and, and when this bill makes it down to the House floor to, to try to resolve this. Okay, there's only three iron ore mines left in, in all of the United States. Two are within my district. And, and again, everyone said iron ore is included. And unfortunately, when we have this other section, it sort of looks like it may be excluded. So we want to make sure we have a firm clarification before we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. With that, I'll withdraw my amendment. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair looks to the Republican side for any amendments. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment that I'm offering in block with Mr. Terry and with uh, Mr. Radonovich. Yeah. Can I reserve a point of order? Uh, three amendments uh, uh, that. Oh, I'm are sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Scalise was next. And I, I, we had, Mr. We told Scalise? Mr. Scalise he'd be next. To, okay, Mr. Scalise, you're recognized. You have an amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk, uh, number 005. Chair, we reserve a point of order. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlelady from Colorado reserved a point of order, and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment deals with the trading component of this piece of legislation. There hasn't been a lot of discussion yet on, on the trading scheme under cap and trade energy tax. Uh, what this bill does is bans speculators, uh, foreign governments from getting involved in the process of buying and selling energy in the United States. So what 
what it ultimately will do, and, and if you look, we, we had some testimony when Vice President Gore was here uh, a couple of weeks ago. One of the uh, comments that came up earlier today was the involvement of Enron in the California electricity uh, crisis and, and the fact that they were speculating. Uh, it was pointed out in the hearing with Vice President Gore that Enron CEO Ken Lay was at the White House back in August of 1997, met with President Clinton and Vice President Gore to help develop the cap and trade scheme. Uh, so clearly Enron had an interest. And in fact, when, uh, when I'd asked Vice President Gore about that meeting, he did not dispute that the meeting occurred in the White House. So clearly Enron had a real big interest in cap and trade because the trading scheme allows for the creation of a new commodities market. It allows for, in essence, rationing of energy in the country where you then have to go and buy the ability to emit more carbon than the government gives you as a cap. And so at a minimum, and it was talked about yesterday a little bit on the regulations in Section 341. There was some talk that there are some regulations to, uh, to limit exposure that taxpayers would have. But the, the prohibitions here do not prohibit speculation. It prohibits excess speculation, but it still allows speculation in this commodities market. And so it also allows governments, foreign governments, uh, to come in and, and have up to 10 percent of the regulated allowances that they could then buy to turn around and sell to American companies uh, at a premium, which would then be passed on in higher utility rates to consumers. So with all the talk that we've had about foreign oil, Saudi sheiks would be able to buy these permits and then turn around and sell them to U.S. companies that would have to buy them in order to emit energy. Uh, the Chinese government would be able to come in and buy these permits. Now, we know that the Chinese government is not buying any more of our debt because we're spending too much money here in Washington. But this is creating a new place for them to go and put their money. So the Chinese government can go up and buy 10 percent, up to 10 percent of all of these allowances on this new commodities market and literally help control the U.S. economy on energy. Uh, that's in the bill. It's allowed right now. My amendment prohibits that. And so as we've talked about all of the dangers of speculation, especially as we've talked about all the jobs that are going to be lost to China, and we tried to block some of that. We were not successful in getting amendments to block it. So if we know China is going to get millions of our jobs, at a minimum, we can stop them from profiting off of the trading scheme in this bill. And so that's what this amendment does. It takes out the ability for speculators and foreign governments like China to buy and trade uh, these energy emitting permits. So that's what the amendment does. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my reservation. Mr. Markey? Yes, I, I, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Um, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I, th I thank the uh, chairman. The objective of the legislation is to create a wide, deep, vibrant, liquid market for carbon. That's the point. And we don't think that it makes sense to limit that market just to covered entities. We want all of the liquidity which is possible to move into this marketplace. Uh, that will give it the stability, uh, but also give it the capacity uh, to be able to deal with uh, this very complex issue uh, which this legislation is seeking to uh, accomplish. There are if, to deal with what the gentleman from Louisiana, Louisiana is uh, raising, there are position limits that are built into uh, the legislation in order to prevent the cornering of the market by any uh, one or group of uh, uh, entities that might seek to uh, manipulate this marketplace. Uh, a lot of what we've been discussing thus far, Mr. Stupak yesterday was uh, making a reference to it, uh, is the goal to make sure that we do not repeat the problems of the past. But to the gentleman's central point, which is what the limitation should be on who can participate in this liquid market, um, it should be those who have the capital to participate. Uh, ultimately, we do want global participation because ultimately from a reciprocal perspective, we want to be selling our technologies, uh, our products around the globe. That's the point. The only 
a goal that we should have is to make sure that these markets are honest, um, that they are transparent, uh, that they are being monitored, that the enforcement mechanisms are strong, that position limits are in place, uh, that the regulators are doing their job. Once that happens, we're creating a free market, the same kind of free market that allows people in the rest of the world to invest in General Electric, to invest in Dow Chemical, to invest in Exxon. If they want to invest, they should be able to invest. But the opposite is also true. We are also able to invest any individual, uh, uh, any entity in our country, in any other company in the rest of the world, if we determine that those markets, uh, all those uh, 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 products uh, are in fact honest, transparent, uh, and reliable. So the gentleman, um, uh, I think, uh, is well-intentioned. But, but the effect of it would be to remove liquidity from this marketplace. Uh, and ultimately, its ability to be able to function uh, will be dependent upon uh, the number of uh, individuals and other entities that are willing to invest their money in this system. We think we have the protections which are built in uh, to uh, achieve that goal. Uh, I urge a no vote on the amendment from the by the gentleman from Louisiana. Will the gentleman yield? I will, I, will, I will yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman. Thank you. Um, I have a concern and observation. Uh, this sort of language may prevent new players from coming into the market. Uh, uh, you always want to have a, a robust market that allows young companies to come up, and if, if they're not certified yet, then they're not going to be able to buy the, the uh, allowances. It's going to make it much more expensive for them to get into the market. Is that a consideration? Well, first, they'd have to have a cap established in order to then be limited. So once, they, once the government under cap and trade energy tax would actually set that <coughs> cap, then they would be a... Uh, they would be a covered entity under this section, so they would be able to participate in that marketplace. All right, thank you. I, I, again, I, I think the language is a, a little uh, unnerving to me, having been on the uh, entrepreneurial side and business uh, of energy production. So uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, wary about the language that we've, we find here. Yes. Let me reclaim my time and recognize the gentleman from Utah. I yield to the uh, chairman. Gentleman's recognized. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I thank my colleague for yielding. I, I think we have to be really careful. We had a discussion last night on energy trading, and, and, and I wanted to speak then, but we had some limited time. But I just want to suggest that this, this amendment is kind of, I think, what can be wrong about overregulating how financial markets work. Financial markets work best when there's transparency and accountability, and that's the goal we ought to have, not just for a carbon market, but for energy markets in general. You know, we had the problem, and my colleague, Mr. Stupak, raised it last night about uh, people avoiding NYMEX and, and doing, in, engaging in what's called uh, trading through the London loophole. We do need to have that transparency and accountability, and that's the proper level of regulation for financial markets. But if we're not careful, and we overreach on this, we'll create a situation where energy prices are going to go up because you're going to prevent people from appropriately hedging risk. And if you prevent them from doing that, they're going to have to increase their cost of energy. So both what we talked about last would night, the language that's in the underlying bill, and this amendment, I just encourage people to be Would you suggest careful. it's a bad thing yeah. for energy prices to increase? I'd the agree. Gentleman's time's expired. Yeah. Uh, uh, with, I'll ask unanimous consent the gentleman be granted two additional minutes. Okay. I, I thank the gentlelady and I yield, I continue to yield to the gentleman from Utah. Well, I, I, I think I made the general point. I, I think we just have to be very careful. I've, there's talk in this underlying bill about eliminating over the counter Martin trades. We've got to be very careful. I just suggest that. This is a, I used to trade these, I used to represent end users in natural gas futures. And I would suggest that there is a role for this market if it's appropriately regulated with appropriate transparency and accountability that it will work. But if we overreach, there will be consequences that I think we'll regret. And this is a complicated issue, very complicated. And I encourage our committee to continue to look at it, but I suggest that this particular amendment, which would restrict uh, an open, transparent market with multiple traders, may create less liquidity and problems in the marketplace. I'll yield back. Well, Jim, and you, I, 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 sure. let, let me just follow up, and then I'll come back. and. Uh, yield to the gentleman from uh, Michigan. Yes. And what Mr. Matheson's, Matheson said is correct. You, you do have to have some liquidities in these markets. That's why in the underlying bill we have in there, CFTC will set up these boards to determine the proper amount of liquidity that should be, you know, whether it's the carbon market, whether it's the oil market, whether it's the wheat, corn, whatever it might be underneath the Commodities Future Act, 
Uh, there's boards that we set up to determine the liquidity so we don't get out of balance, so you don't have an overreach. And, and you're absolutely right, Jim, and I know you've been big help on it when we had the bill before the Ag Committee. But I think this amendment just goes too far, and I'd hope we would defeat it. I'd yield back to Mr. Okay. Mark. I, I thank you. So, so yes, let me, let me just uh, let me just summarize, and, and I think uh, the points have been made. One, uh, excessive speculation is bad, and that leads to a financial bubble. We have to have protections in to ensure that that does not occur. However, we don't want to discourage. We don't want to limit participation in the in the market. Um, because that is likely to result in less trading, more volatility, less liquidity, and a more thinly traded market, and as a result, greater volatility. Um, if we limit it the way the gentleman from Louisiana uh, uh, suggests, we create more problems than are solved. Uh, I think we have got a good formula in place. Uh, you have heard from the gentleman from uh, California. Utah and Michigan, we urge a no vote on this amendment. Gentlemen's time's expired. The vote will now occur. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. No's appear to have it. The no's have it. Request a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey? No. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher? Mr. Pallone? Mr. Gordon? Mr. Rush? Ms. Eshoo? Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak? No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel? Mr. Green? Ms. Deget? Ms. Deget, no. <clears throat> Ms. Deget votes no. Mrs. Caps? Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle? Mr. Doyle? No. Ms. Harmon? Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Joukowsky? Ms. Joukowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez? Mr. Gonzalez? No. Mr. Ensley? Mr. Ensley? No. Ms. Baldwin? No. Ms. Baldwin? No. Mr. Ross? Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Matheson no. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Butterfield no. Mr. Melanson, no. Mr. Melanson no. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill, no. Mr. Hill no. Ms. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mr. Sarbanes. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. I'm sorry, Mr. Sarbanes. Oh, Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney, Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton, Mr. Braley, Mr. Braley, no. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Welch, that's no. Mr. Barton, Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. 
Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Aye. Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Aye. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Mrs. Myrick. Aye. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Aye. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Wax. Um, Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Has every member voted? The clerk will Ms. tally and Miss Sutton. Oh. No. Miss Sutton votes no. <laughs> clerk will tally and report. Mr. Ross? Oh. Did you vote? No. Mr. Ross? No. <laughs> the clerk will tally and report the vote. On that vote, Madam Chairman, the ayes were 20 and the nays were 32. Ayes were 20, the noes were 32. The amendment is not agreed to. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Um, Does the gentleman have an amendment? Madam Chair, uh, would you defer just for uh, about a minute and a half, or is there another minute we could take? I want to check on something before we offer this. Certainly. Some, as, does another member from? Madam Chair, I got, I've got an amendment that's ready. Gentleman from Michigan has an amendment. We've in got an amendment in, in block. It's uh, myself, uh, Ms. Rodanovich, and Mr. Terry. You may I reserve and a point of order in that? Is they, you really want? And while, while uh, the clerk is uh, passing it out, I'd, I'd make a, a couple of uh, comments. I intend to withdraw my uh, amendment, but you still you need to deliver them. And let, let me, uh, oh, is it okay? The gentleman was suspended. The, the uh, clerk shall consider the amendment as read. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, as, as we know, the United States' needs for electricity is going to increase by 30 to 40 percent by the year 2030, and I believe very strongly in a clean energy program, but I also don't think that we can have one without nuclear, and my provisions create a new title that do a number of things, but it also streamlines the approval process. Jobs are important. Uh, I know that in Mr. Dingle's district, uh, the Fermi plant, uh, DTE, uh, submitted an application where they've spent well over $150 million uh, more than a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm looking forward, I hope, to seeing uh, one or both of the two nuclear plants uh, in my district expand. But quite frankly, five minutes is not enough to debate this title as we are getting ready to conclude the bill in the next uh, hour or so. And so I am, I am prepared uh, to withdraw the portion of the en bloc amendment that I uh, introduced 
uh, following a colloquy with Mr. Dingell and with Mr. Hill. And I yield to Mr. Mr. Dingell. Mr. Chairman, I my good friend for yielding to me. I'd like to observe that there appears to be a great deal of merit in the amendment. I, I, I think that, that there is a certain amount of uh, controversy with it also, but I would like to work with my good friend to, uh, if possible, get it into shape where we could uh, offer it at some future time and see to it that it was uh, successfully included in this legislation as we move through the process. So I want to thank him for what he's doing. I have high regard for him and uh, great affection. Mr. Hill? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I would echo what uh, uh, Mr. Dingle has already said uh, about uh, Mr. Upton's uh, bill. You know, uh, uh, the, the elephant in the room on energy independence and clean energy is nuclear. And uh, I think we need to get over the fact that it's not something that America wants to do anymore. And for some reason, we have got this attitude that nuclear needs to be off the table. Well, we need to get it back on the table because nuclear is the one technology that is proven. And we are exploring a lot of different new technologies that may or may not work. I happen to believe that most of them will work. But we know that nuclear works, and it works safely. And so I join with uh, Representative Upton in his efforts to try to jumpstart nuclear, and I want to do my part in lending assistance to his efforts. Well, I thank you both. Uh, I look forward to working with both of you as we prepare an amendment for when this bill gets to the floor, and I would yield the balance of my time on this amendment. Uh, I would ask the unanimous consent to withdraw my portion of the on block amendment and then yield the, the balance of time to Mr. Terry and Mr. Rodonovich. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Uh, and I feel that uh, these three amendments that I have actually strengthen our nuclear program. They're not meant to be messaging. They're real. Uh, one, number 27, uh, authorizes the additional $50 billion to the loan guarantee program. Uh, number 25, I think it is, eliminates barriers to the loan guarantee program, what we found out if you're a joint uh, uh, operation or a partnership uh, that you're excluded from participating in the loan program that's disqualified some so we want to eliminate those barriers uh, also uh, to encourage uh, the modern technology of recycling within the nuclear uh, 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 power what uh, number 20 does is defines recycled uh, nuclear fuel as a renewable. With that, uh, am I authorized to yield to no, Mr. Rodonovich? Please. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Nebraska. My amendment um, uh, is simple, Mr. Chairman. It uh, is, makes the state ineligible to receive emission allowances if the state prohibits or limits the construction of new nuclear facilities uh, for any economic or other reason. It affects about 16 states in the country, and uh, hope for a yes vote on this, and uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ge gentleman yields back his time. So uh, uh, we had how many amendments offered? How but how many do we have? Four. We have four pending, one withdrawn. No, no, no. Okay, so we have four amendments that we're considering with that by unanimous consent in block. And as I understand, there's opposition to that in block amendment. Uh, Mr. Markey, do you want to express your opposition now? And do the members want to vote? Or shall we respond to the votes on the floor? Why don't, why don't you give your opposition, then we'll vote when we come back, unless we can do it quickly. Um, well, this is an important uh, debate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a very, very important debate. So um, I, I, I hope. Well, then why don't you express, use your five minutes of opposition and then we'll come back and vote. Thank you. Um, on the Terry Amendment, uh, this amendment appears to be an attempt to address the issue of subrogation, that is, the status of the United States government as a lender to a nuclear power plant that has gone bankrupt. Uh, 
Uh, we think that if that occurs, the United States should be at the very head of the line of the creditors to the now insolvent nuclear power plant. This amendment is uh, designed uh, to change that, to not let the taxpayers who have provided the loans for the nuclear power plant uh, to be first in line to gain access to whatever assets are left of that nuclear company. Our staff asked the head of the Nuclear Energy Institute whether this language was something that they were seeking. Uh, he just told us, no, they are not seeking it. Uh, and so as a result, this appears to be an attempt to do okay. subrogation. Can you read the language? I'm but it well, was. Will yield for five seconds? I will be glad to yield. That is no way the intent. What, which one are you reading? Do you have the, uh, which, which, which Terry Amendment are we talking about here? Yeah. The Terry Amendment number 25. What? Oh, okay, could, 25 could you, that would the, uh, would the, doing ownership and partnership with another qualified public power entity. So would the gentleman explain if that's if if he is yeah. not if he is not intending on changing the laws of subrogation would he could he explain what he is intending on accomplishing? They, uh, it is not intended to change the subrogation. It is intended that when two entities partner up together, that they should be eligible under the loan program. There's actually been denials of uh, application to the loan guarantee program because they're a joint ownership or a partnership. Can, could the gentleman explain what, it, what exists in the Title V existing program that, the Title VII program that prohibits that right now? I cannot explain that. All I know is that they have been denied uh, joint ownerships or a partnership between two entities have been denied. And we so have, this we, clarifies the language that a joint venture or partnership would still be eligible. If, it, if, if the gentleman would deal, the, the, we, yes, have not been, well, we have sure. not been able to find any language in the law which prohibits that, but we do know that there are some who wish that in the event of a bankruptcy, and since tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money is now at risk because these nuclear power plants are being built with federal taxpayer dollar guarantees. So if something goes under, that means that we lose the money. The taxpayers lose the money. So who do the taxpayers go against? And, uh, and what has been happening is there has been an attempt uh, to modify these subrogation rules uh, in a way in which each one of the uh, entities are not uh, uh, liable uh, uh, for, to the taxpayers uh, for the bankruptcy. And, uh, and so that's the concern that I have. And, Otherwise, the, there is no explanation for an amendment of this nature since there really is no prohibition on joint partnerships. What well, we're concerned if, about if is gentleman, what, happens gentleman, at, what happens at the point at which uh, the, a bankruptcy occurs. Yeah, and, well, uh, and so if, if I can, in, in the, in the uh, Radonovich Amendment, which is before us, it would actually disallow California and Wisconsin from receiving any allowances under this law for efficiency and renewable energy uh, because they have laws that prohibit the construction of new nuclear power plants. So but the, the state of Neal. California under this law would be prohibited from benefiting even though they have exercised their own state's rights in determining uh, what kind of electrical generating facilities that they want to see constructed in their own home states. Will so, the gentleman yield? I'll be glad to yield. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, th the reason I put this um, bill in the hopper was because the f I believe that this bill will result in higher energy prices, and I don't think that we can call for higher energy prices without guaranteeing access to every type of clean and cheap energy to all consumers, and it, that access should be made to all consumers all across the country. I yield back. Uh, all time has expired. Uh, you, do members feel comfortable to vote now? Can I, uh, Mr. Terry, it's your amendment. Strike the last word to engage in a colloquy.
The gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Markey, uh, Ed, the, the plain language, I don't think, does anything here with subrogation. That was never the intent. It was simply, uh, and whether or not the Title VII uh, is unclear about whether it includes joint ownership. The problem is it's being interpreted yeah. internally that way, and so this just simply allows those type of entities to be eligible. Uh, second question, Mr. Waxman, are there any of these four that could be accepted? Oh, okay. I, I, I would like to work with the gentleman, but we do a at, at, at this point I'm just unsure of what the intent of it would be. Let me ask the gentleman if you would. Uh, we don't, we can't, uh, don't find it acceptable at this point, but we'll continue to talk to you, and I'd urge you to withdraw the amendments. If you want, we'll take a vote. Uh, you want a voice vote? I would strongly encourage y'all to withdraw and work with them, honest. Okay. And, and the, they got 36 votes, we got 23, half our members aren't here. Um, we, got, we got five more amendments to do. Gentlemen, would... So if you withdraw them, you, I, I, I will work to make sure that every consideration is given to putting something in this if and when this bill goes any further. All right, I'll withdraw. Okay. Then, gentlemen, withdraws. Unanimous his consent to withdraw my three. You don't need unanimous consent. Oh, we uh, well, are all the authors willing to join you? Uh, I think so, too. Yeah. Okay. All the, the, all the amendments in block are withdrawn. We have a series of votes on the House floor. Please uh, return after that, and we'll try to conclude our, hearing, our markup. The House Energy and Commerce Committee taking another break now to allow for committee members to go to the floor of the House for a series of votes. The House today uh, working on Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization and a number of votes related to that uh, right now on the floor of the House. Earlier today, the House adopted a conference agreement on weapons acquisition. Over in the Senate, additional war spending for Iraq and Afghanistan is uh, on the plate today. More amendments and a possible final passage vote today in the Senate. You can watch House coverage on our companion network C-SPAN. The Senate is on C-SPAN 2. Again, here, members have been working now day four of a markup on energy and climate change legislation. A break uh, for, House, uh, for the members to go to the floor and participate in those votes. While we wait for members to return, we'll show you today's White House briefing with Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. Oh, yeah, no, they all 